viewer, I'm Holly and today's video is going to be my May wrap up. May was a pretty good reading month for me. In April I feel like I lost my reading mojo a bit, I just wanted to do other things but then in May that kind of turned on its head and I didn't want to do anything except reading. I'm still in a huge reading mood and I was able to tackle some really big intimidating books, books that have been on my physical TBR for years. So overall I just just feel like May was a really good reading month for me. Like always in my wrap-ups I will start with my reading statistics and then I will move into a ranking and review of all of the books that I read in May. So in May I finished a total of seven books which was 3,099 pages. This was an average of 100 pages per day, 433 pages per book and then the average time that a book had been on my physical TBR was 10 months months. In terms of star rating I had three 3.5 stars, three 4 stars and I also had a 5 star. I finally got another 5 star and that meant that my average rating for the month was a 3.9. In format I read six physical books and one audiobook. In genre I read three fantasies, two historical fictions, one classic and then one mystery, although the mystery one could probably also be categorized categorised as a classic. In age category I read one middle grade, one young adult and then five adult books. In terms of where I source these books, five of the books were from my physical TBR that predated 2023, one book was a book that I had bought in 2023 and then one book was from the library. For whether these books were parts of series, three of them were standalones, two of them were the starts of series, one was a continuation and then one was the final book in a series. In terms of author status, two of the books that I read were from authors that I have read from before and then five are from new to me authors. And then finally for a little goal check-in, my first reading goal is to decrease my physical TBR. At the beginning of the month I was on 177, by the end of the month I was on 172 which is a decrease of five, I'm very happy about that. And then finally in terms of the number of series I'm in the middle of, I started the month on 54 open series and unfortunately by the end of the month I was on 55 open series but you know sometimes that happens and I'm definitely going to be continuing in some of the series that I started at some point. Okay then, without further ado, let's get into my ranking and reviews. The first book I'm going to be talking about is Tilly and the Book Wanderers by Anna James. It feels quite cruel to put this one at the bottom of the list because I didn't hate this book by any means, it was still a 3.5 read for me, which means that I did enjoy it, but unfortunately I just enjoyed the other books that I read this month a little bit more. This is a middle grade book following Tilly who finds out that she and her family are book wanderers which means that they can go into their favourite books and they can also bring their favourite characters out of books and this opens up the world to her. She didn't know she had this ability, she's figuring out this ability and learning a bit about her mum who went missing when she was very young. First of all there were elements of this book that I absolutely loved. I love the whole concept of book wandering. This book is very much a love letter to books, to libraries, to books shops and I love that it is fostering that love of literature for kids but my main complaint with this one is I just felt it was far too rushed for me. I know that it is a middle grade book but I have read other middle grade that seem to have a bit of a better progression in terms of the plot, in terms of the characters. The pacing of this one it just didn't work for me at all. Most of this book felt like a prologue to me in that you're just following Tilly learning about all these things and that is pretty much the whole book and then there's a tiny tiny section at the end when there is a bit of action and again I felt that was over far too quick. There didn't seem to be any obstacles to overcome. It was pretty easy for them to achieve their aim at the end of the book and because this was so fast for me I just didn't get attached to the characters and that is a major thing for me in whether I love a book or not. I'm very much a character driven reader. I have to really love the characters whether that means I love to hate them, whether they're very interesting but morally grey characters that I want to learn more about. But in this, 
they just fell a bit flat for me and I'm so sad about that because I was so excited to go into this one. I am still thinking of continuing in this series. I think that maybe reading the next book or maybe the next couple of books could get me more invested in these characters in this world. It was a cute fun read that was actually quite a nice change of pace to some of the more intense books that I read this month that I will get into. So I enjoyed reading it but it definitely isn't a new favourite and I thought that it might be. Next I'm going to talk about The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. I read this along with Gavin from How to Train Your Gavin as part of his Patreon thing that he's doing where we all came together and tried to solve an Agatha Christie. I am one of Gavin's patrons and I loved that experience. I think the reason that this one ranks just a little bit higher than Tilly and the Book Wanderers is because when I was reading this I was trying to figure out what was going on, I was discussing it with the other patrons and it was just a really really fun reading experience. This is the first Agatha Christie that I have ever read. In this one you are following this rich couple who find a dead body in their library and then they call up Miss Marple to try and solve the case. I'm not sure if I love Miss Marple as a character because she's a little bit annoying. Essentially she doesn't do any investigating, there's all these police officers doing the investigating and then she just popped up at the end being like oh I've solved it but I will definitely try some more Miss Marple in the future. I do watch a couple of murder mystery shows like Grantchester, Death in Paradise, and they definitely, you can tell that they have been inspired by stuff like Agatha Christie, and I do enjoy those, and I think because this was quite a short book, it gave me those same kind of vibes, which I really enjoyed. However, I didn't love this. It was only a 3.5 star read for me. Like I said, Miss Marple annoyed me a little bit and there wasn't anything special about this one for me. I did enjoy trying to solve it. I didn't solve it. I was completely in like the left field, like out of the box, so far out the box that my explanation was impossible. But nevertheless, I will definitely do this again, trying to solve an Agatha Christie or some kind of classic crime or mystery. I had a great time with the patrons. I love discussing all my theories. And because of that, I did have a good reading experience reading this one. Next up, I have possibly my most disappointing read of the month, and that is For the Throne by Hannah Witten. This is the second book in the Wilderwood duology. The first book is For the Wolf which is a book that I read as an advanced reader copy so I read it before it came out and that was a couple of years ago and I absolutely loved that one. It is following these two sisters in this world where when there are two daughters born from the queen the first daughter is going to inherit the throne but then the second daughter on her 20th birthday is sent into the woods to the wolf. There is a romantic plot line in that, there is all blood magic, there's nature magic. There's a lot going on and I absolutely love that first one. I love the nature, I love the romance, I love the darkness, the grittiness, the bloodiness in that. But unfortunately this one just lacked so much of what I loved in the first one. I did still give this a 3.5. I still loved the writing. I would still read from Hannah Witten again. I liked the world. I think it was quite unique. But there was also a lot in this that I didn't love. So both of these books in this duology are multi-perspective. So you are following both of the sisters and a number of other characters in both of them. But the first book was very much Red's book. Red is the sister who has to go into the woods and then this book is very much Neve's book, The Daughter Who Is For The Throne and I just don't think Neve's plotline or Neve as a character I loved as much as I loved Red and her story. This one focused on a very different type of magic than Red's nature magic. I don't think that's a spoiler to say that Red has this magic. It's explored very early on in that book and I loved that nature magic magic but the magic in this one it is very dark shadows all of that and I have enjoyed that in the past think Nevernight by Jay Kristoff there's a lot of shadow magic and gods and stuff in that and I love that but for some reason it just didn't work in this one and maybe that's because I just love the nature magic in the first one so much that this one it was a bit of a different tone I also didn't love the romance as much in this one there is a different pairing in this one that you're focusing on and yeah there were a 
couple of cute moments, a couple of angsty moments of anguish, but I just didn't have the butterflies. I didn't fully get invested in this relationship. And this book also featured one of my least favourite tropes of all time. I can't tell you what that trope is, it will give major spoilers for what happens in these books, but essentially it is a trope that just diminishes so much of the emotional impact of events that have happened in both of these books and it just frustrated me. The ending also didn't make sense to me at all. I would love if other people have read this book, what they thought of the ending, because something happens that should have had an absolute huge impact on our characters. It should have had really dire consequences, but you know what? It didn't everything was fine. And I can't explain more than that because it will spoil it, but it just didn't make sense. The ending completely let me down. So overall, this one was a bit of a disappointment. It was still a 3.5. I did still enjoy reading it, but considering how much I loved that first one, I think I gave that a 4 or 4.5. This one was a little bit of a letdown. Next up, I have The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wang. This is a graphic novel and you are following this prince who loves to become Lady Crystallia and wear these beautiful dresses and it's about him and his dressmaker. I would categorise this one as young adult and overall I found this very sweet, very cute. I absolutely loved the art style. So for example, that is the kind of art style. It's just very beautiful use of colors. And I loved the art style in this. I love the story. It was very endearing, very cute. The only reason though that I gave this a four star rather than a five star is just that I didn't have the same emotional reaction that I've had to other graphic novels. Think Heartstopper. When I read those books, I just have tears in my eyes from joy from page one to the end. I enjoyed reading this, but I didn't get that same emotional reaction. So still a four star read, I would still recommend this. And this was very kindly gifted to me by my dad. So I read it straight away when I got it. I've wanted to read it for a few years. And if you are interested, I would definitely recommend giving it a go. My third favorite book of the month was Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. This is a historical fiction and you are following a number of people from this family over the course of the 20th century and it's following them moving from Korea to Japan and the effects that that has on this family. It is also looking at how this family deals with the events going on. There is mention of the Second World War. There's a lot about racism, feeling out of place, and this was a fantastic historical fiction for me. I ended up rating it four stars. Essentially, once I picked this one up, I just couldn't stop reading, and even though it is a really chunky book, I ended up reading this in about three days. I just couldn't stop. I was so captivated. I love a story that looks at a family and seeing how events have ramifications over time. This book is set over quite a large period of time and it was interesting to see how the events right at the beginning had such ripple effects within these characters' lives, within the lives of their children, of their grandchildren. It also taught me a lot about a part of history that I knew nothing about. Even though I studied the Second World War as part of my degree, a lot of that is very Europe focused and actually it was very interesting to see the impact that that had on Japan, on Asia and Korea's history as well. It was very interesting to see all those big world events happening through the eyes of just the normal person, of the normal civilian and how you have to just keep getting on with your life. They have their own personal things going on while these events events are battering them around and having such a big impact on their lives. However, there were still a couple of things that I didn't love. The first is the writing style, especially the way that the dialogue was written. For some reason, the dialogue to me felt a little bit stilted. And I think I mentioned this in another video that I wasn't sure whether this was because it was trying to replicate a very formal style of speaking. I have no familiarity with Korean or Japanese and I don't know if that's maybe a more formal language than English. Characters would say everything that was on their mind and it seemed like there weren't any hidden meanings within their speech. I can't really explain it. If you've read the book, maybe you can understand what I'm talking about, but it did throw me out of the book a little bit. Some of the bits of writing just felt 
jarring. I can't really explain it any other way. And then my second complaint is that it was a little bit too much in terms of the trauma. So this family is going through a lot. And while I understand that there are families out there who go through a lot of tragedy, a lot of awful situations, it got to a point in this book where it felt like it was too much. Pretty much everything awful that could happen to a family happens in this book. And for me, it got to the point where so much was happening that I almost felt like it was being used for shock factor rather than naturally having these moments of tragedy within the book. And because it was so constant, it was so relentless, that made me distance myself a bit from the characters because you're like, oh, well, something awful is going to happen to them at some point. I don't want to be too invested in them. And I think that taking out a few of those plot points could have made this book more emotionally impactful. It's the case of less is more, but that is my personal opinion. You might disagree, other people might disagree, but to me, it just felt like it was going too much. At the beginning, I was kind of understanding, you know, these awful things happening, but then it would just be another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. And I don't know if this is based on like any true stories. There's nothing saying that it is, but it just felt like it went too far. Despite that, I did enjoy this. As I said, I read this in about three days. I couldn't put it down. It was still a fantastic historical fiction. And if you're into historical fiction, I would definitely recommend it, giving this one a go. My second favorite book of the month was The Kingdom of Gods by N.K. Jemisin. This is the third book in the Inheritance trilogy. It was originally a trilogy. And now I think there's been a couple of novellas or short stories or stuff written after. So I haven't finished this series yet, but I've almost finished the series. And in this series, in the first book, you are set in this world where there are gods, but the gods have been subjugated by this specific family who are ruling the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. You are following one woman who is one of the heirs to the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. Her mother was estranged from her grandfather, who is the ruler, and she has been summoned and she has to kind of compete for the throne in a way, but not, it's not a competition. There are other heirs, who's gonna be the ruler? You don't know. Now, the three books in this series follow different characters and there are massive time jumps between each of the books in the series. So in the first one, you follow Yain or Yaini, Yaina. I can't remember how you pronounce that. In the second book, you're following a different character. And then in the third book, you are actually following a godling. Now, was I completely bamboozled reading this book? Yes. Did I fully understand everything that was happening? Not really, but there is something about N.K. Jemisin's writing style and her world and her characters that is so immersive and so captivating to me. Again, this is a huge book and I managed to read it in a few days. I was just so in this world. It's so visual, so immersive, like I say, so sensory of an experience that I was just in this world when I was reading it. The, the outside world ceased to exist and I've had that same experience with the other N.K. Jemisin books that I've read. I read the Broken Earth trilogy, I've read these two, I've read a short story collection that I absolutely loved, and I definitely think that N.K. Jemisin is one of my favourite sci-fi fantasy authors. Her characters in particular are just so layered, so complex. Sire, who is the main character in this, he is so interesting, so morally grey, and as a godling, from his perspective, it's so interesting to see how he considers humans and his actions. And I really loved following him as a character. He is like the trickster god. I will say that I wasn't 100% satisfied with the ending. And also this is advanced sci-fi fantasy. The world and the magic system in this is very complex and the magic system itself is very vague. Because you are following gods who have almost limitless power, it can be a little bit hard to wrap your head around everything that is happening. At the end of this book, there is this like huge battle and there were things going on and I was just like, 
what what is going on. So I don't think that this book would necessarily work for a beginner to fantasy. If you're only just starting out, maybe don't read this one yet because I did find it a little bit more complex. You have to put more thought into figuring out what's actually happening. But if you are really into fantasy, you read a lot of fantasy, I would definitely recommend this series. There is a bit of romance in it. There is drama, so much drama. There's death, there's politics, there's gods and I would highly recommend it to the right reader. And then last but certainly not least I have my favourite book of the month, my five star read and that is The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. This one is a gothic classic and it's one of the very early gothic classics when gothic classics were really just hitting off and in this one you are following Emily whose parents tragically die at the beginning of this book and then she ends up falling into the clutches of this Count Montoni. I don't really want to say too much, I think the blurb on the back spoils a lot because what happens on the blurb doesn't happen until about halfway through the book and this is quite a chunky classic but I loved this one. If you couldn't tell I gave it five stars. I I just loved it. I love gothic classics and this captured that gothic atmosphere, that gothic setting so well. There are multiple castle settings in this. It is set in the French mountains or the French and Italian mountains, Apennines, the Alps. There's a little bit in Venice as well and it just got the atmosphere so well. I loved the writing in this. It was absolutely glorious, especially how nature is described and how the mountain setting was described and how there were all these storms. It's very long, the sentences are very long, but there is something just so beautiful, so comforting about this book for me. The plot does take a couple of hundred pages to really start, but once the action starts happening, so much was going on in this book. There is a romance plot line, and there were elements to the romance that were a bit a bit questionable but I did love the romance but then there is also murder, there are bandits, there are sword fights, there's imprisonment, people being kept in castles and locked up, there's people trying to escape, there are hauntings and I, the drama, the drama there was so much, it was so melodramatic, the writing, the action, the characters and I really got invested in these characters. The main character Emily, even though on the surface she seems like this typical gothic heroine who's always crying, always fainting, but actually she has a lot of agency and something that I loved about this book is that the female characters had such agency. They had such control over their money, over what they wanted to do, and they often fought back against the men who were forcing them to do certain things. And for me it had very strong feminist undertones which I wasn't expecting at all. This is quite an old gothic classic. This one was published in 1794 so I was quite surprised to see those feminist undertones that are very clearly present in this. The women are the ones who have the money, who have the power in the end. I loved how all the plot threads came together at the end. I loved how Anne Radcliffe approached the supernatural. There's a lot in this where you're like, is it really supernatural? Is it ghosts? What's actually happening? And I love that questioning of what's happening. I felt pretty much every emotion under the the sun while reading this, joy, fear, anger, sadness, I just felt everything. While there was a fair amount of miscommunication, which I don't usually love, and there were definitely moments that dragged on a little bit, overall I still absolutely love this one. It still came out as a five star read and I'm just so glad that I've tried Anne Radcliffe and I will definitely be reading more Anne Radcliffe in the future. And there we have it, those are all the books that I read in May as well as The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. I think I had a fantastic reading month. A lot of these are quite chunky. I also read a super intimidating classic and overall I just had a fantastic reading month. Hopefully I keep that reading momentum in June. Already I finished a couple of books which is very exciting but let me know what you read in May. Did you have any five star reads? But that is it for today's video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed enjoyed and to everyone out there stay curious. Bye!